Hello and welcome back to our Leadership Mini Lecture Series. In this session, I will be putting leadership into context and discussing what is driving changes in leadership today. Situational and contingency theorists argue that there is no single way of leading and that every leadership style should be based on the situation at hand. And effective leaders recognise that leadership is flexible and use different styles depending on different circumstances. The most effective leadership style for a given situation may depend on factors such as types of staff, for example how long have they been in their posts, the history of the business, um, the organisation, the culture of the business and how it's comprised and the quality of the relationships that exist. The nature and degree and actually the level of change that's required and what are the accepted norms within the organisation itself. Whilst behavioural theories may help managers develop particular leadership behaviours, they give little guidance as to what constitutes effective leadership in different situations. Researchers began to turn to the context in which leadership is exercised and the idea that what is needed changes from situation to situation. Some looked at the processes by which leaders emerge in different circumstances, the moments of crisis or where there is a vacuum. Others turned to the ways in which leaders and followers viewed each other in various contexts, for example in the army, political parties or in high level situations in corporations. Another way of putting this is that particular contexts would demand particular forms of leadership. And this placed a premium on people who were able to develop an ability to work in different ways and could change their styles to suit different situations. Early contingency thinking on leadership assumes that leadership styles are fixed but can be effective depending on various characteristics of the situations whilst latter approaches suggested that successful leaders do actually adjust their styles. For example, Hersey and Blanchard argue that the key issue in making these adjustments is follower maturity, as indicated by their readiness to perform in a given situation. Readiness in this sense is largely based on two major factors, followability and confidence. And their situational leadership model views leaders as varying their emphasis on task and relationship behaviours to best deal with different levels of follower maturity. Hersey and Blanchard developed a model of situational leadership in the 80s that remains very popular today and their model takes the consideration and initiating structure elements of the Ohio State studies which they call relationship behaviour and task behaviour respectively in order to analyse situations in which the leader finds themselves. They argue that in addition to these two variables, consideration needs to be given to the followers since these may not only accept or reject a leader but as a group also determine how much power they have. They focused on followers' readiness or maturity in terms of their level of motivation to achieve goals their willingness and ability to assume responsibility for their outcomes, the level of competence in the tasks that they have been assigned to. And from these variables, Hersey and Blanchard developed an elegant, user-friendly model that proposed leaders should adopt either a directing, coaching, delegating or supporting style depending on the situation they were in. And the popularity of the model may have more to do with its elegance and usability though rather than its, in its accuracy. There is a strong connection between knowing oneself and being an effective leader. And this was a point highlighted by Daniel Goleman in his work about emotional intelligence and leadership. Emotional intelligence describes an ability, capacity or skill to perceive, assess and manage the emotions of oneself, of others and of groups. In 1920, Thorndike at Columbia University used the term social intelligence to describe the skill of getting along with people. In 1975, Howard Gardner's The Shattered Mind began the formulation of the idea for multiple intelligences. He identified seven intelligences including interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence. And many psychologists such as Gardner believe that traditional measures of intelligence such as the IQ test fail to fully explain cognitive abilities. The term 
emotional intelligence appears to have originated with Wayne Payne but was popularised by Daniel Goleman in 1995. The leading research on the concept originated with Peter Savloy and John Mayer starting in the 1980s. In 1990 their seminal paper defined the concept as an intelligence. Mayer and Solovy continued to research the concepts and created an emotional intelligence test. There were numerous other assessments of emotional intelligence, each advocating different models and also different measures. Goleman popularised his view of emotional intelligence in his 1995 best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. And Goleman generalised the uh, Solovy research and adapted it to a general public audience. A part of the human brain called the amygdala does most of the processing of human emotional responses. These responses mostly occur automatically as in the case of the familiar flight or attack response triggered by threatening situations. But we've evolved in such a way that neural hijacking takes place and provides a quick answer to life's critical situations. And this hijacking is said to happen because of raised stress levels which affect heart rate, blood pressure, hearing problems, eye conditions, muscle tension, causing the brain to start reacting to sensory information rather than concentrating on and understanding it in order to make conscious and objective decisions. The amount of control has a genetic component, yet one can learn to control emotions to a certain degree, and most people do learn this at some point. And furthermore, it's possible to hone this skill, achieving greater abilities to manage emotions. Therefore, Goldman believed that emotional intelligence in itself is learnable. Goldman divides emotional intelligence into the following five emotional competencies. Firstly, the ability to identify and name one's emotional states and to understand the link between emotions, thought and action. The capacity to manage one's emotional states to control emotions or to shift undesirable emotional states to move more adequate ones. The ability to enter into emotional states, often at will, associated with drive to achieve and to be successful. And the capacity to read, to be sensitive to and influence other people's emotions. The ability to enter and sustain satisfactory interpersonal relationships. In Goldman's view, these emotional competencies build on each other in a hierarchy. At the bottom of this hierarchy is the ability to identify one's emotional state. Some knowledge of competency is needed to move to the next competency level. Likewise, knowledge and skills in the first three competencies is needed to read and influence positively other people's emotions. The first four lead to an increased ability to enter and sustain good relationships and effectual contextual leadership. So we see leadership as being a dynamic product of transactions between leaders and followers. The leader's role is seen to be one of discovering what motivates followers and then to help followers achieve their goals because of this. Followers then bestow power and status on leaders. Leadership is therefore a relational property within groups. Leaders exist therefore because of followers and followers exist because of leaders. Most of the leadership theories that we've discussed so far have emphasised leadership from the point of view of the leader. We think a trait theory, behaviours and skills approaches. Or the follower and context, situational leadership and contingency theory. And up to this point, researchers treated leadership as something leaders did to all of their followers. And this assumption implied that leaders treated followers in a collective way. But now researchers were starting to focus on what leaders did differently and the impact on each of the leader's followers. This approach involves seeing leadership as a dynamic product of transactions between leaders and followers. The leader's role is said to be one of discovering what motivates followers and then helping them to achieve their goals. Because of this, followers then bestow power and status on leaders. And these new theories show that leadership is a relational property within groups. Leaders exist because of followers and followers exist because of leaders. And there are criticisms of leader-member exchange theories though. Research on leader-membership exchange theory 
places most value on its usefulness in describing the leader-member relationships. The notions of high LMX and low LMX relationships seem to make sense and correspond to working realities experienced by many people. Also, members of leaders in groups seem to be, get more positive performance evaluations and show less turnover than do members of out groups. But other than confirming these outcomes, the usefulness of the theory in predicting leadership success and performance effectiveness in various situations has not been well substantiated. Given this criticism of leadership styles being depicted too much in black and white foot terms, contingency theorists Tannerbaum and Schmidt suggested the idea that leadership behaviour varies along a continuum and that as one moves away from the autocratic extreme, the amount of subordinate participation and involvement in decision making increases. They also suggested that the kind of leadership represented by the democratic extreme of the continuum will be rarely encountered in formal organisations. According to path goal theory, the leader's job is viewed as guiding employees to choose the best paths to reach their goals, as well as the organisation's goals. Motivation is the tool that leaders use to enhance employee performance and satisfaction. It draws on Vroom's expectancy theory in defining what motivates employees. Employees will be motivated if they believe that they are capable of performing their work, that their efforts will result in a certain specific outcome, that the payoffs for doing their work are actually worthwhile. And in order to ensure that their employees feel motivated, leaders need to be flexible and able to change their style as situations require. And this is a core component of the theory. And it moves us beyond thinking of employees as identical blocks of clay that all respond in the same way. This theory acknowledges that all employees are different and it's the leader's job to identify what motivates each individual. And this theory takes a much more individualistic approach than Fielder's contingency theory, which came before it. Leaders therefore need to motivate their employees. According to path goal theory, leadership generates motivation. And it generates that motivation when it increases the number and kinds of different payoffs subordinates receive from their work and makes the path to the goal clear and easy to travel with coaching and direction and guidance and removes obstacles and roadblocks to actually attaining the goal and makes the work itself more personally satisfying. In order to provide the kind of leadership that generates motivation, the theory suggests that leaders use a leadership style that best meets the employee's motivational needs by choosing behaviours that complement or supplement what is missing in the work setting. Providing employees with the elements they need to reach their goals, acknowledging subordinate characteristics, enhancing goal attainment or by providing information or rewards. We think about task characteristics there. Motivating employees and viewing them as individuals is challenging for leaders because they must have a variety of leadership styles readily available and the emotional intelligence to choose which one at a given time should be used based on what the employees need. So if we consider the strengths of path goal theory, it's a useful theoretical framework and one that helps us understand the various leadership behaviours affecting the satisfaction of people and their work performance. It integrates motivation and it's a theory that attempts to integrate the motivation principles of expectancy theory into a general theory of leadership. It provides a practical model that underscores and highlights the important ways in which leaders can help their subordinates. But there are criticisms. The interpretation of data means that interpreting the meaning of the theory can be confusing because it is so complex and incorporates so many different aspects of leadership. Consequently, it's difficult to implement. Empirical research itself has demonstrated only partial support for path goal theory and it fails to adequately explain the relationship between leadership behaviour and worker motivation. It's an approach that treats leadership as one way in which the leader affects the subordinate and not the other way around. The identity theory of leadership draws from social identity theory which states that identity is a dynamic process and shows that individuals have a number of different identities 
but the individual can decide at any time to show just one of these. And when applied to leadership theory, the social identity theory suggests that people have preconceptions about how leaders behave in general and specific situations. These preconceptions are cognitive schemes of types of leaders. When someone is categorised on the basis of their behaviour as a leader, the relevant leadership schema comes into play to generate further assumptions about them. Good leaders are seen as people who have the attributes of the category of leader that fits situational requirements. The identity theory of leadership views leadership as a group process, whereby a group, so we think about an organisation's employees, has assumptions about the sort of identity that they expect a leader to have. They then invest the most prototypical member with the appearance of having leadership influence. And the appearance arises because members cognitively and behaviourally conform to the prototype. This can then become self-fulfilling as the member then starts to have more influence because he or she conforms with the group's notion of what the leader looks like and then followers start to agree or comply with the leader's ideas and suggestions. Consensual social interaction also implies the leader with apparent status and suggests that there is a differentiation between the group in which leaders and followers behave and the characteristics of unequal status actually attains. In addition, a fundamental attribution process constructs a charismatic leadership personality for the leader, which further empowers the leader and sharpens the leader-follower status differential. Although personality perspectives identify some personality correlations of leadership, we can think of talkativeness, and personality explains some variance in the emergence of leaders in initially leaderless groups, Scholars agree that personality alone is a relatively poor correlate of leadership. An alternative situational perspective is that almost anyone can be an effective leader if the circumstances are right. This perspective focuses on leadership as a dynamic product of transactions between leaders and followers. Because leaders play such a significant role in helping followers to achieve their goals, Followers bestow power and status on leaders to start to restore some level of equity. And this process imbues the leader with charisma and therefore additional power. This focus on charisma is particularly evident in new leadership and transformational leadership research. This research proposes that effective leaders should be proactive change-orientated, innovative, motivating and inspiring and have a mission or vision in which they infuse the group. They should also be interested in others and be able to create commitment to the group and extract extra effort and generally empower members to perform. Separate research has helped to characterise how leadership identity is actually established. The main influencing factors are shown here in the diagram. In the 1980s, new theories of leadership emerged that diverged markedly from those that grew out of the Ohio State and University of Michigan studies. And three major studies preceded and prepared for these theories that emerged in the mid-1980s. The first was by Max Weber, who analysed the structure of large bureaucratic organisations as well as political, economic and religious systems. He talked about charismatic leadership he adapted the term to suggest a heroic leader of ex ex exceptional abilities and he noted that power was most often based on traditional and formal authority. However, in times of social or economic crisis, people yearn for new answers and are thus receptive to other sources of power. In such times, it's possible for a leader with radical ideas and a compelling personality to come to the fore. Later leadership theories have borrowed heavily from Weber's original conceptualisation, but also changed some aspects of the original concept. In 1977, Robert House published a book about charismatic leadership, which modernised some of Weber's ideas about charismatic leadership and coined the term transformational. But it was Bernie Bass who popularised the term 
transformational leadership is so named because of Bass's belief that an essential distinguishing feature of leaders is their ability to transform followers to perform beyond original expectations. Earlier models see leadership as a process that involves influencing others to attain goals through giving them specific rewards, where it occurs within a group context in a single organisation and a managerial hierarchy and involves known situation and answers. Most recent definitions of leadership have emphasised the role of a leader as defining organisational reality. Adhering to the path goal theory, transactional leaders emphasise the following characteristics. Setting goals, articulating explicit agreements regarding what the leader expects and how they will be rewarded for their efforts and providing constructive feedback to keep everybody on task. Transactional leaders focus on increasing the efficiency of established routines and procedures and are more concerned with following existing rules than with making changes to the structure of the organisation. Thus they operate most effectively in organisations that have evolved beyond the chaotic, no rule stage of entrepreneurial development that characterises so many new organisations. Now, Within the context of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, transactional leadership works at the basic level of need satisfaction, where transactional leaders focus on the lower levels of hierarchy. They use an exchange model with rewards being given for good work or positive outcomes. Conversely, people within this leadership style can also punish poor work or negative outcomes until the problem is corrected. And one way that transactional leadership focuses on lower level needs is by stressing specific task performance. They are therefore effective in getting specific tasks completed by managing each portion individually. They're concerned with processes rather than forward thinking ideas. And these types of leaders focus on contingent reward or contingent penalisation. Transactional leadership establishes and standardises practices that will help the organisation reach maturity, emphasising setting of goals, efficiency of operation and managing risk and increasing levels of productivity. The leaders who value exchange and tangible rewards for the work and loyalty of followers. Transformational leaders are leaders who engage with followers and focus on higher order intrinsic needs, raising consciousness about significance of specific outcomes and new ways in which those outcomes might be achieved. Transactional leaders tend to be more passive, whereas transformational leaders demonstrate active behaviours that include providing a sense of mission. The extent to which a leader is transformational is measured first in terms of their influence on the followers. The followers of such a, of such a leader feel trust, admiration and respect for them and because of the qualities of the leader are willing to work harder than originally expected. And these outcomes occur because the transformational leader offers followers something more than just working for self gain. They provide an inspiring mission and a vision and actually give them, importantly, an identity. The leader transforms and motivates followers through their idealised influence, which we earlier referred to as charisma, intellectual stimulation and individual consideration. In addition, the leader encourages followers to come up with new ways to actually meet the challenges and to challenge the status quo and to alter the environment to support being more successful. The concept of transformational leadership was initially introduced by leadership expert and US presidential biographer James McGregor Burns. Burns believed that leaders were either transactional or transformational, but later studies suggested that organisations do require both types of leadership, but in different quantities and at different times in their development. More recent work by Professor Beverly Metcalf undertaken with UK public sector workers has demonstrated that all managers combine some elements of both transactional and transformational leadership qualities, 
but that most people have a preference for one style above the other. Both styles are frequently compared and the table here summarises some of the main differences. An increasing number of leadership researchers and commentators have reacted to the focus on transformational leadership models by criticising its emphasis on hero worship. This level of hero leadership and the tendency to devolve into unmeasurable notions such as charisma and its unrelenting focus on leadership as coming from the top down in organisations. Researchers now comment that the complexity in which most organisations operate means that it's very unlikely that any single leader, no matter how visionary or charismatic, will have all of the necessary ideas, talents and answers required for the organisation to succeed. Now, the emphasis is much more on the notion of emergent leadership or distributed leadership, a notion that's been fuelled more recently by thinking about complexity in leadership, but also draws from an earlier strand of work about teams and the ability of teams to manage themselves without formal leadership or managerial interventions. Distributed leadership emphasises the sharing of leadership functions from different perspectives and through various mechanisms. However, from the academic perspective, it has been a very slow to evolve into a clearly defined area of study within a standardised network and a set of broadly accepted concepts. Broadly, we can divide the research and writing about distributed leadership into several distinct theoretical frameworks. Recent research and writings conclude that while the competency framework approach to leadership and the notion of specific transformational qualities both have some strengths. They lead to particularly individualistic notions of leadership and a relatively prescribed approach to development. The changing nature of work and society may demand new approaches that encourage a more collective and emergent view and of sharing the role of leader more widely within organisations. Health is distinguished between the exercise of leadership and the exercise of authority, thus disassociating leadership from former, formal organisational power roles, whilst Raylan talked of developing leaderful organisations. The key to this is the distinction between the notions of leader and leadership as a process of sense-making and direction given within a group, and the leader can only be identified on the basis of his or her relationship with others that behave as followers. Thus the leader is emergent rather than predefined and their role can only be understood through examining the relationships within the group rather than focusing on the personality, characteristics or traits. And this is a more collective concept and argues of a move from an analysis and development of individual qualities to an identification of what constitutes an effective leadership process in an organisation. These informal leaders are those who lack formal positions, but have nonetheless the influence over others. History has examples of leaders who, without any formal authority, rose to incredible levels of influence. Informal leadership is particularly important at the beginning of new initiatives. In leadership transitions and in times of crisis when formal leadership is weak or is challenged by external conditions. The power associated with influential, informal leaders tends to derive from good communication skills, including listening and credibility, and trust of colleagues. Because informal leadership tends to become more important in power sharing agreements, it is particularly vital for teams with a lot of self-determination. And this is where it has been studied the most, often called emergent leadership studies. Followship leadership theory overlaps with informal theory but it is analytically distinct enough to cover separately. While informal or emergent leadership tends to emphasise the separate basis of power of those who lack formal positions, followership tends to emphasise the importance of followers in critically and fairly evaluating formal leadership performance. Barbara Kellerman is a prominent researcher in this area and Kellerman proposed five types of followership followers based on their level of engagement, isolates, bystanders, participants, activists and diehards. Isolates are withdrawn and detached and generally alienated from the organisation, whilst bystanders passively support the status quo with their inaction. 
participants who engaged enough to occasionally invest some of their time. Activists are very engaged and eager to express either their support or opposition towards formal leaders. And diehards are exceptionally committed to ideological positions. Those who have no or little engagement, isolates and bystanders, add little to the leadership process in any circumstance. And those with moderate to strong engagement can add a lot to the leadership process, but it is tempered by their willingness to make informed assessments rather than assessments based on snap judgments or selfish interests. Thus good followers are both engaged and self-informed, and proponents of followership also emphasise the moral obligation of leaders to respect followers as a separate source of authority, wisdom and expertise. Super leadership theory examines what leaders need to do to prepare and support followers to be successful when they are empowered. Such methods for empowering followers include giving fewer orders, supporting an individual team problem solving and decision making, advocating self-leadership, encouraging reflective practice and post-project learning reviews. The main situational conditions which support or hinder super leadership is the degree to which followers are mature, developed and empowered and the degree to which they are satisfied and the degree to which production is already efficient. Super leadership helps to provide a theoretical basis for the empowerment literature that involved in the late 1980s. It provided a clearer picture of aspects of empowerment as a style and as a series of concrete strategies. In the public sector across the US and Europe, where cutting costs led to flatter hierarchies with less managers, super leadership and distributed leadership is becoming widely accepted as the way forward. And there are many reasons why it might be an advantage to have less leadership by formal leaders. Formal leaders have limited time. Less leadership tasks allows them to focus their efforts more narrowly and thus enhance effectiveness in critical areas of the organisation. If followers needed little leadership, the formal leader might be able to focus more effectively in influencing politicians or communities or act as a resource for development or strategic planning. Also, formal leaders are, are expensive, so reducing their numbers saves money. It tends to emphasise the external aspects of monitoring and the external sources of creativity. Less leadership can allow higher levels of self or group monitoring and innovation. And finally, formal leadership tends to concentrate power high up in the chain of command. And empowerment requires a more devolved and decentralised model of leadership. When successfully implemented, empowerment enhances internal accountability, a sense of ownership, professional affiliation and buy-in within group goals. Substitutes theory identifies some key criteria that impacts the successful implementation of these factors. And these include the need for delegating, a delegating style of leadership from those with formal authority, the need for innately satisfying work, predictable workflows, and for provision for followers for formalised rules. There needs to be a strong organisational culture as well. The theory of substitutes for leadership has made a respected contribution to the literature. Firstly, because of the central insight that leadership is not necessarily better. Secondly, if established an intellectual basis for the empowerment, self-management and teams literature in which formal and vertical leadership is reduced. Thirdly, it gave direction and support to those redesigning work systems so that leaders' time and energy could be conserved while workers' effectiveness could be self-managed. And it brought together a widely dispersed literature of studies and micro-level insights about when and how leadership should function. The central insight of self-leadership theory is that attitudes, beliefs, and self-designed behavioural patterns, motivational preferences, make a critical difference in both accomplishment and personal satisfaction in work, whether it involves a manager or a frontline employee. 
Researchers note that those who master effective self-leadership practices are more likely to be successful in gaining higher level leadership positions and in being more considered uh, to be more effective in those roles. Traits that affect or are affected by self-leadership include self-confidence, decisiveness, resilience, willingness to assume responsibility and skill in continually learning. Although the contemporary notion of self-leadership is relatively new, there are no um, shortage of fields that have provided the foundation. In psychology, social learning theory emphasizes the ability of individuals to learn and adapt in complex settings. Self-leadership theory suggests that rather than relying on others for guidance, confidence and goals or stimulation, one should rely primarily on oneself. The self-leadership is composed of self-direction, support, achievement and self-inspiration. A fuller description of the characteristics of successful self-leadership can be found in Fletcher's work from 2008. And leadership functions are delegated not only to self-led individuals but also to teams and we look at this now. As with other forms of distributed leadership, the self-managed team literature was collated in its own right. References to teams from the 1950s and 70s in the mainstream management literature invariably referred to hierarchical teams, teams reporting to a formal leader. The literature did focus on the emergence of leadership in leadership groups, but the primary purpose was to study leadership formation rather than functioning without one. However, in the 1980s, great attention was paid to Japanese innovations in devolution, employee empowerment, quality circles and similar initiatives. And this led to a dramatic uptake in interest in self-managed quality improvement teams, empowerment project teams and various other types of self-management organisations. Commentators on self-managed teams argue that firstly, leadership should not be conceptualised as a centralised downward influence on subordinates and an appointed leader, rather leadership tasks and functions are divided amongst a set of individuals who are acting as leaders. With the prevalence and significance of teamwork in today's work, team members and team processes will more significantly affect individuals' attitudes, motivations and behaviours. And consequently, researchers have developed conceptions such as self-managing teams, while the team itself plays a more active role in generating, maintaining and changing individuals' behaviour. Finally, as suggested by Fletcher, it will become increasingly unlikely that in a world of growing complexity, a single leader will possess the capability and the competency to understand, solve and actually improve leadership situations. Katzenbach and Smith provide some good examples of the types of conditions that must exist for self-management teams to perform at a high level. And these include a shared common purpose and goal by the team. The group must be truly self-managing and all team members must be mutually accountable and answerable for their own performance. For this work, Katzenbach and Smith assert that power relationships within the team need to be relatively equal. The work performed by the group must be sufficiently complex and result in some sort of finished end product. Managers in the organisation must be supportive and committed to the use of self-management work teams. Team members need to have the ability to work with others and a desire to work as part of a team and teams should not be too large. They suggest self-managing teams of between 10 and 25 people are best. High-performing, self-managed teams do not happen by accident, nor are they easy to attain. In fact, self-managed teams take even more socio-technical design than normal vertical leadership teams do. And so far, we have looked at the types of distributed leadership primarily focused on sharing power within one organisation and potentially with clients or client stakeholders. Network leadership de-emphasises the role of both leaders and followers in order to emphasise the need of the network, the system environment or community. It recommends a collaborative style and is often part of the discussion about moving from a government to a governance approach and various types of inter-organisational and cross-sectoral forms of cooperation. 
Critical to understanding network leadership is an appreciation of the arguments made about its merits. It's a theory that emphasises longer term perspectives in order to deliver desired results. It recommends a cooperative win-win perspective. And this approach maintains that all systems, but particularly those charged with enhancing the common good, have limited resources that tend to be squandered when a systematic approach is not utilised. Thus, collaborative leadership is more likely to occur in communities and professional environments that are sensitised to communal needs and accountability, and where individual leaders share a collaborative disposition. Network leaders tend to have a particularly strong service mentality and be very good at consultation and environmental scanning. They have a strong sense of community and are perceived as having genuine goodwill and a lack of a hidden agenda. And ideally, network leaders have time and resources to contribute to the greater community without having to worry about an immediate or concrete return on investment. They are judged by their contribution to building community mutual learning and sharing and cooperative problem solving and working on wicked problems. You know, rather than trying to get a bigger piece of the pie, network leaders work to expand the size of the pie for all. And perhaps not surprisingly, the research base about network leadership is heavily influenced by public sector and not-for-profit perspectives. Relational leadership is the branch of systems theory that emphasises the process of leadership rather than the people who populate it. In some then, informal leadership, followership, super leadership emphasise different perspectives on the power sharing relations in the leadership process. Substitute theory, self-leadership and self-managed teams focus on concrete strategies for reducing formal leaders' roles to enhance better distribution of responsibility. Network leadership takes power sharing outside the organisation altogether.